So good morning and a very pleasant day to all of you and very, very warm welcome to Association of Nurse Practitioner Juniors, uh, MPRR. And this year, as we have committed, we are reviewing the WHO patient safety curriculum. So we had reviewed in January patient safety. What is patient safety? In February, we looked at the uh, human factors and in March, we are going to look at understanding systems and the effect complexity on patient care. So all these are going to be delivered. The entire session for 2022 will be delivered by Association of Nurse Executives India's Patient Safety Fellows. We have got seven uh, you know, ANI members uh, undergoing the fellowship program in association with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation from USA. <coughs> Sorry. So creating a smaller version of a large book into understandable way by using the presentation and delivering is uh, the project that has been taken up by the Annie Patient Safety Fellows. That's why every month is gonna happen. And the most important thing to remember is also <clears throat> that in December, there will be a quiz based on all the 11 month deliberations. So, well, no, don't worry if you don't remember, you just have to go back and look at the videos. So the quiz will be created from the contents of these 11 months, right? So every month it is on our YouTube channel. So if you subscribe, you will come to know that uh, when it is being released and you can go back and look at the video any number of times. So, so this month we have um, uh, Ms. Ishita Chanda. Uh, she's an MSN with uh, over 15 years experience. I think I got it right. And she has worked as a um, nurse educator, quality nurse, apart from her clinical experience at the bedside. And she's a um, product of uh, CMC Velour, uh, Chennai. And uh, she's also worked as a CNO, ACNO, AC, so different roles uh, she has done. And right now she's with us as the patient safety fellow. So she will be uh, deliberating on the topic uh, today. Before I welcome her in, uh, just a shout out to everyone out there that all nurses who want to think of contributing to the profession, we want to invite all of you to join us and uh, let us know if you are interested. And uh, of course, this is a heads up for next month. That will be by Again, one of our patient safety fellow, uh, Ms. Glory Havila. So she will be discussing being an effective team player. So with that, let me stop sharing the screen and um, invite Ms. Ishita Chanda to the group here. A warm welcome, Ishita. And um, maybe you can unmute yourself. I will just give you the permission. Okay, I just asked you. No? Yeah, I could able to do it now. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the warm welcome. And good morning to all of you present here. So ma'am has already introduced the topic. And before we proceed, let me quickly uh, pull up the presentation for today's. I hope uh, the presentation is visible and I'm audible to all of you. Yes. Ma'am, if you get that. Okay, thank you. So friends, as we know that this year, Annie is committed to zero harm towards patient safety. And one of our cornerstone is to deliver that through our Empire R, which we conduct every month. And today, this month, we are going to discuss about the topic three, which is taken from the WHO curriculum on patient safety, we will be talking, discussing, and understanding what a system is all about and the effect of complexity on patient care. Now, before we proceed, you know, we all try and strive to give the best quality care 
to a, to a patient and keeping patient safety in mind. When I talk about patient safety, it is not only the safe and effective care that is dependent on the knowledge, skill, technology, et cetera, which the frontline workers are delivering. But it is far apart from that is also the cooperation among the team members, how they communicate and do the right thing each time at the right time. And that's how, or that is what we are going to talk about is dependency on the system. So we will be looking into few of the objectives that we will be proceeding before, you know, our topic is, we will be understanding what a system is all about, how the system helps in reducing the errors or adverse event. We will also look into what is a complex system, how healthcare is defined as a complex system, and how we have the role, what is our role basically in this, and how can we safely deliver healthcare or how safely we can deliver patient care in this complex system. That is what will be our main focus on. So before we start, here is a you know, case study. I'll look into the case study, I'll be telling, and then we'll discuss what happened in this. So here there was a 65 year old woman who came from a rural background. She was operated for TKR, total knee replacement, and the surgery went on well and it was successful. Everything was going fine until the third day of post-operative where she complained of abdominal distress and she complained and she had vomiting, you know. So she notified, uh, the nurse notified to the doctor and the doctor prescribes a medicine on antiemetic. On the similar same day, this patient refused to be ambulated. She refused that she doesn't want to walk out of the bed today. So well, fine, third day went on well. And on the fourth day, this patient complained of chest pain. And later she was diagnosed with pulmonary embolism. Well, it was good. It was good luck of her that she survived and the pulmonary embolism was resolved. So this was just a nutshell of the case study. Now let's discuss what went right. So what went right here? Yes, obviously lucky that we were able to survive this patient and she went home, she was discharged. You know, we could save her life. I think that's what was the main, you know, most of the important thing that we see in this case study, patient life was saved. Let's discuss what went wrong, you know? So what went wrong here? Let's see, do simple, simple one or two ways what happened. This patient complained of abdominal distress and the patient complained of vomiting. The nurse informed to the doctor, the doctor prescribed some medicine. But here we fail to understand or dig more information from the patient as to what caused this abdominal distress. Now the nurse here failed to ask history, whether she passed motion, was the bowel open or not? So when we did an RCA, we found that the patient did not pass motion for three days. The need to be very you know, critical in your thinking when we're taking care of patient, post-operative patient specifically, we know that post-operative surgery, you know, post-op patients have been given a lot of analgesic. And one of the complications of this analgesic is your constipation. So because of this constipation, the patient had this distress. And because of the distress, the patient started vomiting. And also because of this distress, this discomfort, she refused to get herself ambulated. Now the question is, did we really inquire about these things? We failed to do that. And we were not able, we, none of us went and asked the patient as to why she is refusing to get herself ambulated. Now, this is where our system failed. In the system, when I'm talking about the system, why it failed was the doctor and nurse, each one of them were dependent on each other, but they failed to communicate to the patient and get to know what was happening, what, was, what wrong was happening to the patient. That's where we failed. And finally, we could see this patient develop a complication, though lucky enough to save may not be in every situation and scenario we could save such patients, isn't it? That's what is our system we are going to talk. Let's quickly to understand better on what a system, 
we will watch this video everyone makes errors all the time it's it, it's a it's sort of a part of the human condition and uh even uh, uh someone who tries tries their very best will will still uh will still make some errors we've moved from focusing on uh, error to focusing more on harm in part because it's become clear that um that for for many things that we thought uh, were not not preventable we can actually prevent a very large uh, proportion uh, the classic example is CLABSI or catheter related bloodstream infections where where uh, one time we thought that was just a complication of of, of having a, a central venous catheter in place but um, now we know that if you follow a, a, a set of uh, uh, procedures or a bundle, you can essentially eliminate those those infections. And and uh, we've had similar findings for for a number of other areas. So so um, you know I think it makes much more sense to focus primarily on on uh, on harm. There are many different definitions of harm. The Harvard Medical Practice Study defined harm as harm that resulted in death or disability at discharge or prolonged uh, hospital stay by two or more days. I think that's too too uh, narrow a definition, and uh, and I think it should include uh, anything that that causes a substantial issue uh, for for a patient. So uh, something like uh, an IV infiltrating might not have been considered harm in the Harvard Medical Practice Study, but I think, I think it should be, should be considered harm and it should be something that we're trying to strive to prevent. So, well, I think you could understand what the video was trying to explain about system. You know, we need to understand that we will face problems, there will be errors, errors are inevitable, and we need to prepare ourselves for that, isn't it? So just that we're not focusing only on the error, but we need to focus on the harm that is there. Okay. So harm is, what we are talking is about harming the patient. That's what is our topic is today. How system will play a vital role that can prevent the harm or the error in patient care. So, you know, let's talk about uh, life of a nurse, okay. And I think perhaps everyone have come across this uh, juncture or, you know, where we, as a novice nurse, when we come across, we think a lot of things in our life that we'll be doing this, that and all, okay. And then we we'll get involved in the system. So basically, when we talk about the system, system is not a fragment, okay? It's a whole that we need to look. Though it has interacting part, like interdependent team members. In hospital, we have a lot of interdependent team members, like the housekeeping department, FNB, clinicians, our dietitians, everybody. Each and every person, each and every team plays a vital role in patient care. And that's how, that is what we talk about is input. So to take care of a patient, these interdependent team members playing their role, individual role in transforming the patient care. And what we get to see from that is the outcome that is our patient condition, that is the safe care that we are talking about. And last, we also get the feedback from either it is from the patient or the patient relative or also among the team members as to how well we did or how well we did we perform in taking care of the patient or doing the procedure. So these are the basic characteristics that a system plays in, in any setup, whether it's in hospital or in any organization that we are talking about. So how to understand the system that a part of the system is also called as complex system. And that's what I was discussing about a novice nurse. So remember when a nurse 
uh, comes out in an intern or a you know just fresh graduate, she thinks of working into a, in a you know very big hospital, a medical college or a corporate hospital which has a lot of technology, etc. I remember when we had in a post graduation and graduation final year, we had tours into different hospitals and we used to get so overwhelmed seeing that oh wow what a lovely hospital wish I could work in that right so that's how is the dream and then finally when we get absorbed into this organization or this hospital we see a lot of complex system a lot of multiple departments interrelation and everything we sometimes get worried that how will we getting how well we will get absorbed with this complex system is and that's become a little worrisome for us. And finally, once this nurse is being absorbed, she's placed into a clinic or a unit or a department, whatever name we call. It. And there she juggles with her routine work. And that's how her life becomes. She focuses only on that eight hours or 12 hours of duty. But often we forget that the system that is, evol that is revolving around us, around the patient care, so that is the interacting part, interacting with the other departments, because those are also crucial when we talk about the patient care. Sometimes it is challenging, you know, to understand the complex system because we have different people working around us in this complex system, different team, uh, different components, and their behavior is also very different. To work as a team becomes challenging at times when we work in a complex system. So often we say that healthcare is a complex system. You can see in this picture, a lot of gadgets, a lot of people. Yes, obviously healthcare is a complex system, but let me tell you the most complex system in this whole world is human being, the creation of human being. We human beings are complex in ourselves itself. Then can you imagine a complex human being taking care of a complex patient with a complex diagnosis, with a complex treatment schedule in a complex organization with the technology? Isn't it you think it is too complex? But just to simplify it, any complex always has its own base. That is a very basic thing that we need to understand. Our base should be strong enough. Then we can build the castle and make it very complex. So whenever we talk about complexity, something comes that is error. There is increase in chance of going wrong. How much ever we try our best, can we prevent errors? Sometimes we can prevent some errors we couldn't prevent. So with complexity, with juggling of too many work, yes, there are possibilities where things can go wrong. So what makes healthcare complex? Now, if you remember the case study that we discussed, right, in the first case study of a TKR patient, what was wrong was this patient it was from a rural background. Maybe communication was a problem. The, none of us would have gone and asked the patient what was his or her, what was her problem was. Here we see patient coming from a different background, clinicians from different background, Staff, they have their own work. They have, they have their diversity in task. Are these parts interlinked with each other? Dependency on healthcare. Here in this case scenario, the nurse and the doctor was depending on each other. What was the depending? The doctor depended that the nurse will give the correct information. The nurse just have said that, you know, patient uh, had vomiting and she forgot that to auscultate and see the bowel, hear the bowel sound. She forgot to inquire about the bowel pattern or bowel was opened or not. Similarly, the nurse was dependent on the doctor that the doctor will come see the patient and give his best of care. Probably even in the rounds, they must have neglected that this is from a rural background. They must not have inquired about the basic thing we are talking about bowel opening or not. Many times I have seen, we talk about a lot of, you know, high uh, modality of treatment, um, treatment, et cetera, many things, but we forget the basic. We need to focus on the very, very basic needs. And I remember the Maslow's hierarchy, which talk about the basic needs to be addressed first. 
So as nurses, we should never forget what is the basic requirement of a patient and inquire about those needs to the patient whenever we take care. We also see different relationship all across. As we said, we are multidisciplinary team. We have housekeeping staff, we have administrator, we have support team, everybody. How is the relationship with each other? Because each relationship also caters to the needs of the patient. Nevertheless, with upcoming evidence-based practices and technology, we get super specialization, the needs of a transplant unit is different. The needs of the patient in a transplant unit is different. Need of a patient in a critical care or a medical ward or a you know, surgical wards, everything is di uh, different. And with the specialization of needs, we also get different types of patients. We get vulnerable patients. We need to be more intelligent in delivering the care to the patient. And we also have the technology updated technology that is coming into role in patient care. At the same time, remember our process, our care pathways, critical care pathways in rendering patients of different diagnoses and diseases. So in whole, I would say that this is what is making our delivery system, caregiving or health care is becoming more and more complex about, isn't it? So let's discuss about uh, uh, in a department. This is, was an emergency department. So this emergency department was focusing on reducing their tap time. Now, what is this time was uh, turnaround time. They wanted to reduce it so that they can cater more patients. And, you know, uh, so they wanted to ship the patients all faster. So the team sat down to think how better we can do from what we are performing at present. Here, they failed to take or involve other people who were actually in uh, somewhere directly or indirectly connected to this emergency team or department. They only sat as a team, as ER team, and discussed how they can roll it down, how to work on it. But to the horror, things, instead of improving, it worsened. They were not able to transfer the patients to the ward in a timely manner. The nurses were not able to prioritize the care that was required to be given to the patient. Patients were waiting for a longer time, so waiting time increased. So with the waiting time, the number of patients in the ER also increased. And finally, what happened that led to increase in error. So my dear friends, what I'm trying to make you all understand from this is, let's not play into small team or silos. Look to our system as a whole. When we talk about system, it's not only one department, it's a multiple department that we are discussing and talking about. So there were two uh, school of thoughts, you know, and I'm pretty sure many of you sitting over here will agree with me also. Uh, you know, there were traditional approach and we are going to talk about a new approach or the system approach. So we said that in a complex system, errors can occur, right? So there could be errors. Now, what is that system approach will view when there is an error? Their view and traditional view will be discussing about it. So system approach very meticulously looks into every error. Errors that happen, that is adverse event, as well as the potential risk or the potential harm. And that's what our iceberg phenomena is. It's not the peak that we that is visible, it's underneath the water. That is what is more dangerous. And we don't want that iceberg phenomena where you know, a lot of potential risks are neglected. In a system approach, they do not neglect even a near miss. They take everything very diligently and tries to see how these errors can be prevented in future in causing harm to the patient. System approach also looks very minutely to the process map or the process flow. Most of the time, we think about the traditional approach talks about only the human factor or who is responsible, where a system approach talks or checks out the process. Is the process in place? If it is in place, where, in the, where did the error occur in the system or in the processes? System 
also views the team approach. As we have discussed that, you know, our healthcare is a complex system. We have different people coming from different backgrounds. The team approach is very important. Now, how to develop a good team and how this team caters to the need of the patient and deliver safe patient care. That is what is very important. They do not believe in blame culture. They do not focus on who did it, or rather they focus on how did this occur. So blame culture is not encouraged in a system approach. Another factor is financial constraint. Now, we would like to do many things for our patient care, but financially, maybe we are not strong enough. The management have very limited resources, and that could be, you know, that financial constraint have prohibited us in buying or purchasing something which could have improved our patient safety. For example, a bed which will give an alarm as the patient gets down by, by himself. Okay, so there, these are the approaches, the system approach digs into every, every small factors and understand where did it fail rather than why it failed or who, rather than who did the mistake. Let's see, what is the traditional approach talking about? Now, the traditional approach is something which I think many of us have been a victim of this approach where punitive action has been taken. So the first thing we find it in a traditional approach is who did the fault? So when I was working as a CNO and morning when I used to get the report from my supervisor, if there is an error, any adverse event has occurred, so he'll call me and say, ma'am, such and such doctor or such and such nurse did an error. The first thing, Miss X nurse did this medication error. So you're getting the flavor of what I'm trying to say is human tendency is to find who is at fault. We try to look around who to, on whom to give this burden. So finding fault. Second, they try to find if we have find an pro, you know, who has done the mistake. Most often you will see it has been always blamed to the fresher or the junior most worker who have just recently come. We think that, you know, she is or he is a very uh, novice person. So the blame can be very well put. And sometimes that's what happens. And what happens later to it is people stopped reporting errors. Now, these fresher co-workers or the frontline workers, they shut their mouth and even they see things going wrong, they never voice up or rather even they have done an error, they do not proactively come and tell you. What is that these leading to? What is leading is the number of errors or the intensity of the adverse event is increasing, right? And finally, we are in a bad shape and this is not what we are looking forward. We are looking for a healthy environment where our patients are safe, our healthcare workers are safe, and we need to prevent such approach in our future going. So when we're talking about errors, you know, sometimes we need to know certain errors that happens, and these are some of the terminologies that we need to understand basically is. We're talking, when we talk about errors that has caused because of some negligence. Now, what is this negligence? So this could be an act of omission or commission. Let me give you an example. Now we all know that whenever we give medication procedure, we should be carrying the medication administration chart or the patient file. Why? So that we understand exactly, we match the medicine with the strip, with the mar sheet, medication administration record sheet, as well as we do the correct patient identification, right? Now, if the nurse doesn't take the medication chart and she writes down in a paper and takes it to the patient bedside to give medicine, just because she says that the, med the chart has been taken by the doctor for writing the discharge summary, or it has gone for the billing downstairs in the billing department, is it acceptable? It is not acceptable, right? Because you each time, Remember, we said that doing the right thing uh, every time is what we are expected to do. So 
you must be telling that I have been taking care of this patient for past 10 days. So I know the patient very well with the name and by, you must have by heart the UHID number also. But whatsoever it is, you need to be diligently doing this for your patient's safety. Because we don't want a single lacunae will lead to any hazard to our patient. So the patient here, the nurse here, should have kept the medication record sheet and send the remaining file for the billing to the billing department. So that's how a negligence can occur and this can be harmful to the patient. What is professional misconduct? Here, the nurse pretends as if you know, she knows the procedure well. She's very scared to, or she is very shy to tell that I have never witnessed this procedure and I have never done this procedure before. But maybe she thinks that I have 10 years of experience. How can I tell this to the other team that I have never done this procedure? So rather I put up a face as if I'm confident I know this procedure, I can do it. Well, the nurse goes ahead and she harms the patient because she has never done this pr procedure before. So over the period of a three years or four years of experience in our nursing career, we are expected to gain certain skills, certain competencies in a procedure that we need to exhibit when we're talking about the patient care. So when we did an RCA for this, we found that this nurse was not confident or she has never seen this procedure and she has done a misconduct towards profession. Mistakes. Now, mistakes are things that was not anticipated, but it happened. So let me give an, another example. One of the very, very crucial procedure in a nurse's life is, is giving medication. Now, when a nurse is preparing the medicine, she needs to do drug calculation. She needs to do the cross check of the medicine, expiry date, everything, right? So when she's focusing on medication, if she's been disturbed a couple of times, you know, doctor's round has come or such and such person has called, or the patient has asked for the nurse, et cetera. There are a lot of interruptions in this procedure. And finally, what happened? We, this nurse will make a mistake, right? So, we need to see if this mistake happened as to what was, what did, what things led to occur these mistakes. So I remember uh, quite a time ago when we were trained by John Hopkins in Baltimore, uh, they had a white color apron, so, uh, sorry, yellow color and, you know, a light eluding a, a gown sort of, which they used to wear it when they were preparing medication in the room. So when a nurse wears it, so the other people knew that she is going to prepare a medication. So we are not going to disturb her or distract her by any means. So the call was taken by the team lead or the in charge that any call comes regarding this nurse, they will be tackling it. So what did it mean is we are trying to give more time to this nurse to focus into the procedure which she or he is doing. So. That's how we have to look into how we can, you know, elucidate or how we can eliminate these errors in, how, in reaching our patients. So the new approach talks about multiple factors and these factors are nothing, but they are revolving just around the human factor. The error has occurred. How did this error take place? We need to find out what were the factors that led to this error? Maybe the patient or the provider was not in you know, sound mind. What was the task given? Was the task very complicated? Was there any workflow on how to do this task? Technology and tools, was the nurse competent in handling the syringe pump? Was she trained on it? Was my syringe pump well calibrated? So all these factors, how was the team? Was the team helpful in making my nurse comfortable in working my unit? What was the environment? Was the environment hazardous or how did I give assignment to my patient? Is one patient in the front, one backside, all four patients in four directions and all that thing. And how is the organization factor or the organization helping these nurses to grow? All these factors are you know, helping and identifying how the errors can take place. 
So this was Reason's Swiss cheese model, which I think most of us are aware about this model. What does this model talk about? So the model talk about an active error. That is, the worker has done, there is an error that has taken place and could be an adverse event. Now, let's go behind and find out how did this error take place? So there are a lot of preconditions catering to this error. So these are called the latent conditions. Have you thought about any, was any poor design, poor procedure, poor management, anything was there to help this uh, nurse or was these things in place or what led to this error? So to prevent these errors reaching to the patient, there were level of defense. Now, what is the level of defense that we have for our nurses? Our alarm system, our safety barriers, our warning signs. Have we given an awareness to our nurse about this error, if the error take place, or how we can this error take place, or an understanding basically about the procedure or not? So these are multiple level of defenses that help us to understand that how can we follow each line, level of defense and prevent the error from reaching to the patient. I'll talk about the navigation team, you know, the aircraft, where we talk that, you know, when Six Sigma, the level of significance over here, or, you know, is pretty high when we talk about the Six Sigma level for an aircraft or the navigation team. It is far beyond Six Sigma. It is seven or eight Sigma. Whereas healthcare is in a sigma or level of 3.4 to 3 to 4 we can raise. Now, what am I trying to tell is, how many of us have heard about uh, accidents or mishaps related to aircraft? Do we hear this every day, every week, every month? How often do we hear? But working in an organization as a team member, how many errors do we hear in per day, in a month, in a year? That is what we are trying to talk is, are we giving safe care to our patient? Fly in an aircraft where we don't know the people, we don't know the pilot, but we are much safer. Rather, working in a team where we know each other in a healthcare, are we giving safe care to our patient? This is the question. So in a, uh, the pilots, though very much we experienced or a fresh pilot, they have to diligently cross check every checklist that is being given to them before they take off the flight. So when they sit on their chair with the co-pilots, they check every details of the flight where every wing, every part of the flight is being well checked. And once everything they're fine, yes, everything's perfect, then they're ready to take off. Now, if the pilot says, I have flown so many flights, so many hours, and I'm an expert, I don't need to check. Are you confident in sitting into the flight where the so confident pilot is there? Because we know errors can happen anytime. So in our healthcare, we have multiple of checklists. One such checklist is our SSPL, where we talk about a surgical safety check. Touch your heart and say how many of us really diligently follow that checklist or rather it has become only a tick list. Only we just check it. Do we really follow each and every sentences that is written in the checklist? Do we really do the sign in, time out, everything perfectly? It's a question. Anytime a failure occurs, then we go back to the checklist and see the checklist is all ticked then how did this error happen? So my dear friends, we have a lot of alarming systems in our healthcare, in our day-to-day -day life, which tells us how to prevent it. And if we do it properly, definitely we are in a safer boat. So talking about these pictures where we have the aviation, we have the nuclear power point and the naval. So, these are also organizations, these are also services that are catering to the patient needs, just like our hospitals, isn't it? Or just like our healthcare. They are classified as high reliability organization. And those who all have participated or were present in the previous 
um, MPRR in the month of February, we did discuss a little bit about HRO. These are called high reliability organization where the chances of failure rate is very, very low. So we will just look at this video and learn what is this high reliability is about. We go outside of healthcare to see our system in a new way and get fresh ideas for improvement. Today we're going to learn about a safety system to handle a totally different hazard. One we rarely face in healthcare, we're going to look at dangerous snakes. Hi, I'm Kathy Duncan, and today we're going outside of healthcare to the Central Florida Zoo. The Central Florida Zoo has a lot to teach us about safety. Specifically, we're going to learn three valuable lessons about reliability. In order to create reliable systems, we need to prevent failure, identify failures and mitigate their effects, and learn from failure to better design our systems. How does the zoo apply those concepts when handling venomous snakes? My name is Michelle Hoffman. I'm a reptile keeper at the Central Florida Zoo. I've been here for four years and I work with one of the largest collections of venomous reptiles in the Southeast uh, within AZA Zoo. Michelle took us behind the scenes to show us how they stay safe when handling snakes, to clean their enclosures and to move them. The red and the green cage cards actually will tell us at a quick glance if the snake in the enclosure is venomous or non-venomous. So the red obviously is the venomous, the green is the non-venomous, red, stop, green, go. And what's this number one up there? The numbers above the enclosures actually tell, tell the keepers how many animals are in the enclosure. So, uh, for example, there's only one Aruba Island rattlesnake in here and there are three pythons in that enclosure. So we know if we open the door and we only see two animals, there might be one hiding somewhere to keep your eyes open and actually find all of those animals before you reach in or before you do any work in the enclosure. All this helps prevent snake bites. But what if a failure does occur? When keepers handle snakes, they work in pairs so that if something goes wrong, there's a trained person there to help them. We're expected to work really closely with our coworkers and our managers. We have a very open relationship when it comes to trust and um, being able to speak up. They also use a belt clip with key information about the snake, such as the antivenom. So that way if something goes wrong, somebody can come in from the outside, know exactly how to handle the situation and which antivenom to bring with you to the hospital. This helps to reduce harm if a failure does occur. The next principle of reliability is that you may redesign your systems based on what you've learned from failures. It's been over 20 years since we've had a venomous snake bite here at the Central Florida Zoo. And one of the reasons for that great track record is because we were always uh, adapting and adjusting and learning um, how to improve our systems to prevent any failures in the future. For example, they used to use a lanyard instead of the belt clip with all the snake information. We actually switched it to the belt clip in order for it to be completely out of our way and not in any sort of position where it could get attached on anything or a snake's tail could get hooked around it or anything like that. They also modified their trash barrel to have a plexiglass window. window on the top so that they could see where the snake is. One of the main ways a little bit wrong or that maybe wasn't working out the best, we can go to them and ask for advice without feeling like we're inferior or something like that. Every time I visit the zoo, I see opportunities to standardize, mitigate failure, and even redesign the work. But they've, they've taken opportunities to really look at how they can keep not only their keepers safe, but they can keep their animals safe. So as you go about your daily work and daily life, look at other opportunities to really see how you might can bring things back to healthcare. So, how was the video? I think all of us were looking at the snakes only. Yeah, we had a lot of reptiles over there. But what was the message that we were trying to understand from the video? High reliability. 
what were the characteristics of a high reliability? Now, just to clear your doubt that here we are not going to talk only about the high reliability about navigation, aviation, or you know, nuclear. You must be thinking, why are we learning this here? Because we want each one of you to be a high reliable nurse, a high reliable nurse leader, a high reliable organization. And that will help us in improving our patient care and bringing patient safety in place, isn't it? So what did we see? What were the characteristic of our high reliable organization is they were having preoccupation with failure. Now, what is this? Please try to understand, we cannot be overconfident and telling my hospital is the best, my team is the best, my nurses can't make mistake, and there will never be failure. We need to acknowledge and plan for errors that can happen, you know? So we should be in open in our mind that we are juggling with a lot of tasks, high-risk people, high-risk patients, high-risk uh, medications, many things are there. So there are chances. So first is get yourself clear that errors can happen at any moment, whether we are alert or not, we, it can happen, acknowledge. Commitment to resilience. Now, we need to proactively seek into those areas where we see threats and we should contain those threats from reaching harm to the patient or from reaching to the patient. So there you must have seen that they were looking at that. They said there was no uh, snake bite for the past four years. Maybe they had before, right? So what they tried was they tried to look into the threats. Like I'll give you an example. All of us, we know that we have the LASA medication, look alike, sound alike. Now, why did that come around, come into existence? Why there was color coding or tall T uh, letter uh, writing? Or why these high alert medications were kept in a separate area or in a separate cupboard? Maybe because, or we have seen in past days that there were a lot of errors happened because of this high alert medication, high risk medication, which was fatal to the patient. So thinking on those part or anticipating the threats, we have formulated many such things which will help in preventing harm. So in your coming tour of our, this WHO curriculum, you will be learning various tools. And what's, one such tool is FMEA, where we anticipate using this tool to find out how, what are the high risk errors or how, what are my high volume errors that can happen to the patient. Next, we have seen the sensitivity to the operations. Now this I will put in the basket of the leadership team where we as leaders need to be patient enough to listen to our coworkers or the frontline workers. It can be your first day, a novice nurse who just stepped in, a fresher nurse. She comes up and say, ma'am, I'm finding it very difficult to work with this, you know, this particular device or even with the shoe that she's wearing, you know, you need to understand that they are the frontline people who are giving care. If they are not happy, they are not smooth in their process of what they're working with, they will lead, they will turn and they will do mistake and error. That time you can't say that, you know, why you didn't tell me. Now, if you want them to tell, you should have time to listen. So one of the things that I started or many of the CNOs must have been doing right now is uh, we used to have coffee with the team members or especially the nurses. When I was working as a nurse educator, I always used to check back on my, uh, the new nurse who have joined, just joined and keep a pad on asking them, how are you? What is the thing? How, anything that is disturbing you, anything you're finding it difficult. No. So a lot of things I could get to know, which I may have not have anticipated. Okay, this can be a problem. Sometimes we leadership team are also having our traditional thought like, okay, you have, you're facing this problem. I have faced it also when I was a nurse. That is not correct. If you have faced a problem, you must try that my team doesn't face the same problem, isn't it? So that's how we should be sensitive when we are talking about sensitivity to operation. Listening to our team members is very, very important. Last, not the least, is a culture of safety. What are we talking about culture of safety is a just culture. Now, in HRO, 
they actually appreciate and give reward to the person who find errors or who comes out with potential hazards or the risk that is associated with okay so what they do is they actually try to find out that if we do this this can cause a problem so before the problem reach to the individual or to the team they try to fix it up so they actually encourage such team people so here in our healthcare are we really encouraging and nurturing our nurses to speak up now this is something my personal opinion like i have been in training and for past 2 years i'm doing a lot of virtual training when we ask at the end of the session we ask any doubt was it clear our nurses often fail to you know voice up any doubt that they have they have a lot of doubt but they fail to open up and say as nurse leader as organization we should develop this culture of safety where we have the voice to speak up and just not take any punitive action against that person who finds out finds or you know the error or the hazard it is not only that you know you're finding errors or mistake into other people or oh, she didn't do that then is it really going to affect the or patient care if it is then it's better we take it up and we reward and we appreciate that person so we always have this good catch right so we award these people and a good catch okay you have found it out that's well good so we come to the end of our session today and just to quickly summarize on what we have learned about today is we need to shift our thinking from a traditional approach to a system approach and the system thinking not only talks about what is seen but rather what is unseen and we need to anticipate the various risk risk harming the patient that could harm or that have happened also any risk that can be environmental risk and anything that we are talking about and remember we are working in a complex situation with a complex mind our mind is very complex it runs here and there you know so keeping that complexity in mind remember not to forget our basics that we need to keep in mind every time we are taking care of the patient and last not the least remember that any error that happen we learn by our mistakes so working as a team is challenging nevertheless remember teamwork is a bouquet where you have different varieties of roses flowers thorns and leaves but totally we call it as a bouquet so delivering patient care is also like a bouquet where we have different multidisciplinary team members technology different complex behavior of the team member but remember we are working for one logo or one motto that is our patient safety and that's what we as a team of any patient safety fellowship program we are trying to render this knowledge and impart it to each one of you gathered here that keeping our patients safe and nurturing our future nurses and up and our ongoing nurses how to deliver patient care safely timely manner each time that is what is integrity is talking about whether we are there or not you must be doing the right thing every time whether i'm watching or not watching so thank you all and thank you for actively participating and hope to see you in coming next month training on um, patient safety uh, continuing the journey of who curriculum so that's it from my side uh, i would like if you have any doubt thank you so much thank you thank you ishita thank you very much uh, everyone and i'm going to run a uh, short poll um just one question i would like you to look at your screen and answer that question i'm just going to run that question okay just one question that's it okay question on your screen please start clicking the answer i will never know who has answered so feel safe about answering okay interesting interesting let's get some more numbers in 
friends, let's get some more numbers in. Okay, we don't have many. Come on, only 25 people have answered. At least 50% of the people sitting here should be answering. Yes, friends. I'll give you an opportunity. I will unmute all of you and then you can ask some questions, have some discussions in a in few minutes. The moment I hit 50%, I will end the poll. Okay, 43%. Hello, hello. Safe nurses. You're all here to make ourselves more safer for our patients, right? Please do not forget, the more we work towards patient safety, we are making ourselves also safe. Nobody will come and ask you what happened, how happened, when happened. So you don't like, nobody likes to be questioned, right? So why to get into that situation? 48% percentage, 50% uh, okay, there you go. I end the poll and uh, I'm going to share the results on your screen. So we have, um, well, Ishita, I think whatever that you told them have, you know, motivated them. So that 73% they are feeling safe that they should speak up. So I think um, I, I love to congratulate all of you to for deciding that, you know, you should speak up. Yes, it is very important. That's the responsibility of a responsible nurse that you speak up when you see something wrong. That's our that when something is going wrong around you and also speak up in case you have made a mistake. That is another speak up, very important to own up and tell, okay, this is what happened. Uh, so friends, uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, just give me a minute and I will show you that uh, next month we will have Miss Glory Havila speaking about being an effective team player. So every uh, every month, you know, we will be getting one of our uh, patient safety fellows to come here and, uh, you know, speak to us. So that is for next month. And thank you very much, everyone. Something that's going wrong with my presentation. Okay, no worries. So once again, I'll see you all next month. I'm going to stop sharing this one. And also I will try to unmute all of you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop recording and then we can.